I'm just very open. Again, it's one of the things that I think allowed me to be a group managing partner. You just got to be open to anything. Episode 142. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I have the fabulous pleasure of speaking to the group managing partner at Grimshaw, who is based in Sydney, Mark Middleton. Now, I had the great pleasure of um, being at Grimshaw when Mark was one of the partners there back in, gosh, it must have been around about 2009, 2010, that sort of time. Um, So I know Mark and he was a a fabulous uh, leader at Grimshaw and it's been very exciting for me to connect with him again and to hear how his career had further evolved and his what his role is now at Grimshaw. So Mark joined Grimshaw's London studio in 1996. He'd been working for British Rail and Transport for London and since then has worked on a variety of projects in different sectors including leisure, ecotourism, commercial property and transportation and he has been a real pivotal character in providing leadership and creative direction to many of the practice's award-winning rail and aviation projects. Mark has been instrumental in establishing Grimshaw's preeminent position in these sectors. Uh, He's worked on many large-scale projects such as Heathrow Terminal 2B, Polkavo Airport and station redevelopments at Paddington and the Fulton Centre, which is pretty amazing uh, building if you ever get the chance to go and see it in New York City. And uh, most notably, Mark was partner in charge of the development of a £1 billion redevelopment of London Bridge, which completed in May 2018. Uh, And this is the project that was nominated for the RBA Sterling Prize. And uh, Mark was also led the design for the Southern Cross Station in Melbourne, which won the Lebeckham Prize in 2007. So Mark has had a lot of experience as a senior leader at Grimshaw. He talks about being the group managing partner, the managing partner whilst he was in the London office, and he discusses what that role entails, what leadership means at Grimshaw, the structure of the business, how they win work, how they go about looking for new projects, how they bid for those projects, and we talk in depth as well about the sorts of metrics and things that they keep a close eye on to ensure the business is running profitably and keeping its high standards of design. So sit back, relax and enjoy Mark Middleton. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Mark, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks for inviting me on, Ryan. It's, uh, yeah, sort of, um, I don't know, is this your first uh, kind of intercontinental uh, it's, not, it's, it's not the first international podcast? one, but it's the first one in Australia. Oh, good. I like to be, uh, I like to be treading new ground. That's good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, pleasure to be speaking with you. Now, you've, been at uh, Grimshaw. You're currently the group managing partner at Grimshaw. Um, you, right. I understand you've been at Grimshaw for over 20 years. 25. 25 yes. years. 96. Is that right? 96. Yep, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 1st of March, 1996. Fantastic. And you've served over, you've served two terms as managing director when based in London and now you're currently the group managing partner. Yeah, yeah. Each studio has its own head uh, and we, we we run it as we're a partnership so there's a partnership of sort of 20 partners so we have um kind of uh, locally elected uh, managing partner studio managing partner so i did two terms as the london studio managing partner and then uh we we also have a group managing partner which is you know it's a ceo in some people's parlance but we have a you know i'm the managing partner for the group so i look after the operations of all of the all of the studios and my responsibility is to um, kind of, uh, you know, make sure we're hitting our targets, set targets, you know, put initiatives together and try and just optimise optimize the partnership and uh, help alongside our 
our chairman, who's Andrew Wally, and the, and he, sorry, the chairman's office is dealing with kind of strategy and kind of uh, you know ethos and, and and kind of position. And then I'm I'm fairly and squarely dealing with operations, and that's four three years. Um, but you can do two, you know, you can do two terms Got if it. you wish. But I'll definitely my my the thing I learned uh, from my two terms in London was to only do one term. <laughs> as group managing partner it's uh, i think that um i think it requires a certain amount of energy and i'm not sure you can keep it going for for that long and and, and it's and it's a kind of a part-time role as well so i'm still doing projects so i, I came here i came here to sydney in october and we bid um we had a bid for the sydney west metro which is a new line for nine stations so i was at the forefront of that bid and we won uh, four stations and the depot there so i'm i'm busy my day job is is um, being an architect still, so uh, right. So, and so projects and all that. So you you see, so still roll the wear the hat of designer and like project architect, and you're involved in the projects as well. It's not just a purely business operational role. Once you're a managing partner, no, it's not, and that's because it's a term basis. Because actually, you know, you you do it for three years, and when we leave. You know, it's it's um, you know you've got to go back. You could say so you go back. You're you're willingly go back to to running projects. And I think what we learned over our time is that um, we didn't like it to be a kind of uh, you know the pinnacle of someone's career, and and they kind of forget. You kind of lose touch with the business uh, and lose touch with the kind of you know the so the, the ethos, the people, the yeah. clients. So it's a very important kind of giving yourself, you know, challenges challenges from a business and there's new things you've got to learn and then there's also that you know you're keeping the creative side alive so it's quite I think it, for me personally it's quite it's quite taxing for anyone who does the role anyone who does a managing partner role in their studios it's quite taxing um, but I think it's rewarding because it allows you to have that other side to it but it also allows you to um, you know step away uh, gracefully and uh, and you know carry on doing your architecture afterwards and, and you know continue contributing to the to the life of the business. So, how, how do you how do you get to become managing partner at an architecture practice like Grimshaw? Uh, I mean, practically speaking, we've, you're voted in. Right. You, uh, you, 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 you're nominated, and then you're voted in by your peers. Um, you know, your your fellow partners. That um, you know, so there's an ownership, and there's obviously the, there are employees. So you're invited in by by the ownership, and kind of the, the way we do it is. Once you're kind of nominated, you put together a, a manifesto would be a too broad a word, but the things you're going to do. Mm-hmm. So I put together a few things when I was going to be group managing partner, and then it was it was voted on, uh, and then and then and then you take up the role. Uh, so I think it's um, it's quite good. But in terms of how do you get there, um, I'm not sure. You know, when I joined Grimshaw as a a package architect doing a block work details for toilets at Terminal Three South Wing. That I ever thought that I would be, I would be doing. You know, I've done the projects that, that I would do, but also Grimshaw were only, was only twenty eight people at that moment in time. Yeah. It was a very small, a very including Nick. So it was a very small practice, really. Uh, with you know, it had been bigger before. It had been about seventy odd people during Waterloo, but had, had fallen back. Uh, so I didn't, really, I didn't really think about it. I think you just, you can you kind of. I've, I think I've got a natural, uh, without sounding too kind of arrogant I think I've got a natural business acumen you know I was always good with the with the fees and a deal and and um kind of uh, a very I don't know whether it's because I'm a I'm a Yorkshireman but I'm pretty practical and straightforward and you know so um I think that that helps as well so there's things within yourself but then I've I've led some very big projects with big teams of you know 30 40 50 people mm. Uh, so all of that stuff, you eventually kind of get to the point in your career where, where you sort of where, where you think actually, you know what? I think I, I've, I do have strategic ideas. I do think that I, I, I can give good counsel. I think I can, uh, you know, as managing partner, what you're doing is in, in our business anyway, is you're corralling the opinion of the partners. You basically you chair the meetings, you set the agenda, but you are, you know, you you've got to learn chairmanship and you've got to learn kind of you know how to properly hold a meeting, you know, which is. You know, to me, is not sitting there saying, "Right, we're talking about this. My idea is this. Do you all agree?" That's that's the, the worst way of doing it. Mm. Is this is the issue? You frame the issue, and then you go around the table to my fellow partners and ask them what they think about it. And actually, 
a lot of the time, you know, you don't you don't even give your opinion because the you know the opinion is kind of formed, uh, or you or you you always give your opinion last would, would be my advice because that's good chairmanship. I think bad chairmanship is is going first um, because I think it quashes ideas or it pushes people to their fringes, and uh, but also it, it it erases the chance that you might be wrong or you've missed something or you've um, you know someone may have a brilliant idea and I'm lucky enough to have some incredibly talented. Uh, you know, fellow partners, but also senior figures within our business, and you know, I, it's like it's like our designing. You know, you 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 listen to everybody, and and you try and choose the best way forward. So, I think probably uh, as a younger man, I was maybe a bit too headstrong and impatient, and too in love with my own thoughts and my own direction. And the older I've got, the more that I've realised that actually you know, there's, there's a lot of wisdom out there. So we can kind of listen and synthesize. The best strategies is, is a synthesis of all the best ideas and then, and then taking that forward. So I think that's how it, I think that's how it came about. There's not really a, a, a sort of roadmap, but I think also it's really the confidence in yourself that you can do it. So once, once it was suggested to me, I, I thought actually, so somebody believes that I can do it. Right. So I should really give it a good try. How how did the role of managing partner evolve at Grimshaw? Was it something that even existed when you first arrived there? No, not really. the 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 business this was a limited company, and it had Nick uh, and, and a few other directors, and um, uh, one of which was 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 Chris Nash, who became the kind of as Nick didn't want to, uh, you know, take. You know, he, he wanted a kind of broader role rather than a specific operational role. So Chris took on that mantle and became a kind of the, the kind of you know what 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 became the kind of group group managing partner for for many years. But I think it was a kind of a, it was a role, and, and Chris kind of became further and further distance away from projects. So when it kind of reached the end of his time uh, as as doing a group managing partner thing, um, you know, he, I think he found it very difficult to get into. Uh, into uh, projects, so, so in, in the end, he decided to leave and got his own, his own consultancy. But it kind of set things up, and we then, when when Chris uh, stepped down, we decided to remake it into a kind of term basis because we recognised the challenges that Chris had faced. Uh, who, d- um, but, but but the good thing that Chris did, because he was he had the idea of making a limited an NLP, yeah, um, opening the partnership up. Uh, Jolie and myself were the last two. Jolie and Bruce and I were the last two directors made of the limited company, and then in two thousand and seven we became a NLP, which was kind of I think uh, Chris was the driving force, but it was kind of Nick's idea. And Nick's plan was really that if you're a limited company, there's kind of barriers to entry because there's an inherent kind of value of the company. You've got to buy in, and certainly if you're um, you know you're a working class kid like me. Who you know doesn't have a trust fund to kind of dip into, yeah. um, you know you've got no money to buy in. So I could never buy in. Whereas, whereas here, there's a very low, um, you know, to become a member is very low. You've got to be invited, but it's it's actually you know it's 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 nothing really. Uh, it's a few thousand pounds. It's nothing more than that. But you've got to be invited to in there. And it was kind of, you know, Nick effectively kind of gave the company to us. Um, and he, you know, trusted us to take it forward. So, but Chris was in that in that d- decision making. So he had his foot in both camps, if you like. Mm. So he allowed the rest of us, uh, a lot of which are the, the partners now, to get to get into that. But then we kind of remade the role into a term role. So um, so Julian Bruce did it for a couple of terms, and then Vincent Chang's done it for a couple of terms, and then and now I'm 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 in doing it, and we're kind of sharing it around. And, and I think the benefit of sharing it is that, you know, in a few cycles, you're going to get, you know, a group of people all with experience of having the responsibility yeah. of leading either a business or the total business. So actually, we think that the, you know, the business intelligence uh, of Grimshaw will, 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 will be quite high, certainly from our, from our perspective. Well, so that's really, really the really that's that's advantage. But how are you saying that you know you kind of wanted to be you, you know people want to remain being architects as well or being involved in projects and that's often a, you know something I hear a lot with managing partner roles that people or architects will kind of shy away from it sometimes because of the loss that it might mean in terms of doing design work so actually the two having experience in both and not relinquishing one for the other kind of seems to make a lot of sense. 
Yeah, I think I think it's I think it is incredibly important because it allows someone. So Kirsten Lees, who's our London managing partner, has done some fantastic work. He's a great designer. He also very kind of feels her responsibilities well and is a good leader. And uh, I nominated her as my successor when I left uh, the London studio. And I think you know it's she's been doing the role, been doing real well. I think it's been difficult. It's always difficult to juggle the two, but you know she'll be going back into you know full products full time in, in, in six months time so i think it's quite good that people who would normally not have that experience are are able to gain that experience and, and, and to be honest you know i became a partner because of my architectural work i didn't became i didn't become a partner because i was particularly you know good at business they i was i was you know i i won projects i designed projects we won awards you know that's why i i became an owner yeah. Um, and then, you know, and then some of the owners display good business traits and good traits of, of you know, kind of of leadership. I think I'll put it that way in terms of and I, when I mean leadership, I mean leadership of the partners. Mm. Because leadership within a project is distinct and different from leadership in a business terms. What, what, is, what is the difference between leadership in a project versus leadership being I think just I just think you can be more single-minded. You can be more single-minded, and it's kind of you can you can you know you can um, you, you can really dictate the direction that you're going within a design project. Um, whereas I think that with you know within within business, it's just more about consensus. It's more about consensus. Plus, you've got to spend quite a while. I've got a fly. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, across the screen. I know, in there, we've been attacked by an insect. Uh, yeah, so you can, you know, you can, uh, you know, we've got our C suite uh, as well. So we've got like our CFO, we've got a CPO. So you've got to be, you know, you've got to be much more in tune with more broader things. So I think it's, you know, there may be project parallels there, but I, I just think you can be more, certainly, I've got two hats. So I can be much more single minded. Uh, about my design work, uh, you know, you know, I've got a smaller group of people I'm dealing with. Um, it's not that I'm, I'm bossing them around, but it's just there's a smaller group to deal with on technical issues, which I know a lot about, especially if we're dealing with the infrastructure space. Mm. I have 25 years or more of experience in that stuff, so I know exactly the challenge we've, we've, we've got, whereas the business ones, some of them are, you know, entirely new, entirely new situations, um, and you've really got to listen. Um, and, then, and then, you know, come up with a, you know, because we're a partnership, you've got to then come up with a recommendation. You've then got to sell the recommendation. You've got to get people to vote for that recommendation. And yeah. Sort of go. And you've got to be able to do that quite quickly because a process like that could basically bake atrophy into your business or, but you, but you need agility. So you've got to kind of be able to very succinctly come up, you know, get to the point, get to a recommendation and get it through the whatever layers of governance that, that you need uh, uh, and then action it, it immediately. But we have different, you know, we have different levels of, you know, we have a, so we have um, an operations group, which is which I chair, which is made up of all of the managing partners from around the world, uh, around the world. And we meet um, uh, twice a month. I've then got an operational executive, which has the C-suite and myself, Right. Plus one partner who who isn't on the operations group, who's just a another partner in the business who sits for six months. That was one of the initiatives that I brought in when I was GMP to sit and just to get their experience and just a slightly different take, uh, even if it's about tone of message or priorities or something like that. So yeah, we try and make it a pretty inclusive process. Um, and but but you know all of inclusivity and communication takes time. Got it. In in terms of um your kind of how your role has expanded now what are some of the key skills that you've got to be good at to be a to be a successful managing partner um well i think the ability to well it's an architect's ability which is to make complex things simple right you know be able to to, to listen and to be able to sort of you know if you've got a particular challenge is to make them quite uh Quite simple because you've got to get them across. You've got to get very complicated issues across to not only partners, but to all staff. So, for instance, we're coming up to our half year and I've initiated a kind of an all staff kind of webinar uh, so that all of our staff, so we can give kind of, you know, good communication on where we are as a business. Uh, but you you don't, you know, I won't be giving the same information to the, part, to the partners as I am going to give to the staff because, you know, it's it's, it's a different thing. There's no obfuscation. It's just that they just don't, you know, you don't need to go into so much detail. Uh, but but you need to begin to interest the staff in business issues. So that, that 
that's one thing. I think, you know, having a good, sensible head around finances and then have a kind of, I think, I think be strategic. And I know lots of people think they're strategic, but they're not. But it's about being able to think of things uh, strategically. So, so just to talk about two things that I brought in. We're working very hard on a performance dashboard for the business, which looks at uh, people. Uh, it looks at you know, finances generally, obviously, and it looks at bidding. So we've got quite a lot of things around. So our finances are kind of looking around. Uh, we look around staff cost ratios, operational cost ratios, um, you, know, under, you know, understanding understanding those terms. Also, you know, utilisation um, and, and, you know, trying to see how the business is running and then, you know, try and guide the local managing partners to, you know, you need to look around these statistics and right. these utilisations for your, for your staff. It's not the be all and end all. But it just we just know that if you're here and here, you know, if you're this this staff cost ratio, this operational cost ratio at that revenue, we'll know we'll make that profit. So making getting that across is quite a, a key thing. And then on bidding, you know, we've got a lot of data. So I've, we, we're kind of getting a lot of data together now and using, you know, um, uh, you know, bidding by sector. I'm getting them to do bids and potential fees, and then we've we, we normally place one against another, so we have a bid cost ratio for each of the sectors we work in so you know is it costing us two percent of our potential fee to win the bid or is it costing us 20 percent if it's costing us 20 percent you know why is it costing us 20 percent because we're basically eating up potential profit uh so i've got all those statistics and it's not just to go through the numbers but it's just then to be able to say right what does this tell us you know are we driving you know uh, along are we, are we going to a right destination or have we managed to go through the central reservation and we're in a field you know, this is these are these are things that, that I'm trying to put in, and then just basic ones around uh, people, uh, how many people we have, what part time working, gender diversity, uh, ethnicity. Um, uh, you know, just just general, general levers, churn rates, things like that. So we collect quite. We we actually have a lot of data within the business, so we've been pretty bad at using it. So mm. we're trying to use that without making it laborious. So so we, we, we we've automated it and we've made it. You know accessible graphically um and so we're just in the process of that and the second part was i've overhauled our how we deal with our global opportunities so that all of the stuff that's outside of our home territories so we've got america australia and the uk um what we do outside of that so we've we've checked we've kind of divided the world up into four regions and we have you know more people involved in looking for projects we've got lists of kind of we've got a proper PPA process, we've got a proper commercial risk process, you know, so we just, we kind of, you know, um, we, we've got a kind of list of reactive projects because we're, we're not particularly good on the proactive at the minute. We, we're trying to make that better, but we've basically now got a list of countries and sectors, you know, of the balls that are thrown at us, which ones do we want to catch? Right. And which ones do we want to, do we want to duck? Because you are thrown, you know, as an international practice, and, and again, it doesn't sound like I'm gloating, but you, you are, you're thrown a lot of opportunities, but not all of them are good ones. That's interesting. How do you so basically? How do you determine between what's a proactive project and a reactive project? So ones that just show up are the reactive ones, and then proactive ones are the ones you're deliberately going after. Or... Yeah, we we do some proactive. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. That in a nutshell, the way you've done it is 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 is, is how it is. We we get a lot of reactive w ones. We're either scouting for them or or, the, or they're they're thrown at us. Some of the proactive ones are. We've been proactively chasing, as an example, aviation projects in China, and we've just won one, which I think is going to be announced quite soon. So we've just won one, but we've been doing a lot of research into, you know, LDIs, potential partners. You know, where are they spending the money? What are the projects? What are the sustainability credentials? You know, uh, all, all you know, we've been doing that kind of due diligence. So that's more of the proactive side, um, and then uh, we've also been proactively researching, you know, countries like Indonesia or. South Africa or you know you know if something comes in from there what what would we do now we haven't really done that before as a business so we've actually got ourselves in a quite a good place the proactive strategy still needs a bit of time because although we know what kind of projects we want it's got to be put in the context of our studios and how they want to develop so you know so we've got an office in Dubai which is a small office that's been dealing with Sustainability Pavilion for Expo, which has just been finished, and a couple of other projects with Amber Botanic Gardens, which I which I designed and was involved in. 
but it's but all the bidding is done from London effectively uh, or or the states. So the question now is, well, actually, if we've got projects in other parts of, you know, maybe say we say we get a project in Saudi, we don't know, we've, we've not got one at the minute, but say we did, or, or mm-hmm. may, maybe uh, on the west coast of Africa or even in India, would we, you know, would we, what would, what does a bigger Dubai office look like? What is its relationship with the market? Does it, what kind of leadership does it need? Does it need a partner there? Do we need to build a kind of bidding team there? So there's a lot of, so, so what we're trying to put the reactive, things you want to do we can only probably do two one one or two of them because we can't probably afford to do any more than that you know so we've got to decide what they are and then we've got to contextualize within within our business within our businesses so as an example we've got a small studio in los angeles which has got about 12 people whereas global opportunities does not pay any part in developing that business because you want to get that business to 30 within the next three years so right unless operationally there's a there's an advantage of our partner they're doing it he's got some particular skills or or or, or, this, or you know they don't, they don't have any work and we want to have to keep the office going and or the, you know maybe an might be another operational reason for doing it but in terms of global opportunities it's going to have it doesn't have anything to do with it we want to get it to to an office of about 30 people based in california you know on california work so it needs to concentrate on that dubai is a different case uh, even sydney and melbourne have you know we've got you know, 80 to you know we've got about 100 and, Hundred people in Sydney and about eighty odd in Melbourne, uh, but based on that national work. So actually, we've always tended to try and have thirty percent international in our offices. In that we're in that kind of unusual and, and privileged position, um, and we haven't really got there in Australia. So we're looking, you know, how does work in the South China Sea area and, and China? Uh, you know, how does that how does that fit? What kind of work would we get? How how can how can we get that work? It's really interesting um, how the, the offices begin to evolve internationally. Is it normally because you get a project in one of those countries, say for like in, in Australia or in, or in New York? Did you win the project first and then the office emerges out of that? Yeah, I think that's how you do it at the start. I mean, I was involved in both projects. I was involved in the bid for um, the Fulton Centre, uh, which... Yeah. Um, you know, effectively kind of moved Andrew and kind of, we don't, we had other projects there, but really, you know, that was the kind of real point of departure for us there. We had the office there and obviously I, I did the design of Southern Cross Station and that started our office in Melbourne. So those have been the kind of bridgeheads, if you like. Whereas latterly, so Sydney, we didn't have any work here. So we actually, um, we, we approached Andrew Cortese, who was, uh, who was actually the managing director at BBN at the time. Uh, and, and he came and worked for us and set up an office with basically himself. Uh, and within, you know, whatever, 10, 10 years, he's managed to get an office of, you know, more or less 100 people. And um, where in, in LA, um, as, as Andrew Burner used to actually, actually work for me as a, as a principal and was, you know, my kind of, uh, my guy on, on London Bridge. Um, yeah. he, he was, he's got an American wife and he was emigrating, wanted to go to LA we had some projects there. We had a, a, the LA connector, so we just thought it was a good thing to have to have a, an, an office on both coasts. So we've kind of we've backed him, and, and we've done that. So we've been more sort of, I guess, progressive in the way we've thought about it. But generally speaking, it would be big project. Big project needs people in a particular right, I mean, um, right place. Yeah, but, but it hasn't. I mean, we've had projects in Dubai, but we've always had a front door. We've had people there so they can knock on doors and. And you know, uh, make sure we get paid, hmm. and, um, and and meet potential clients, and and do that kind of the first meetings, and then work out which partners or principals or other staff could come then to support whatever business opportunity is 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 is, is there. But we've had a very different model, say to say Rogers or Fosters, where they've still sort of you know, although uh, I know you know Foster still has a bit of an office in Hong Kong, has a bit of an office in Cupertino. Uh, because of you know, the remnants of the work, yeah. Uh, but they're basically fly in and fly out practices. Uh, whereas we've always tried to, I guess, mix the kind of local and the international. We've always felt it was really important to be embedded. When we found a place that we liked, mm. we wanted to be embedded in in, in the kind of local scene, uh, and you know, kind of cross that kind of divide between being kind of international and local, which does create problems for us because some people go, well, are you local or are you international? You know? And we've had some problems when 
you know, like in Australia, all of the cultural projects, they always want an international with a local. So we've always gone, we can do both. <laughs> and they've basically gone, mm, no, you can't. No, no, you're either one or the other. You can't, you know, we can't. So we've had a few problems with that in the past because I don't, I don't think we've, we've always played our, you know, I don't think we've played our comms strategy, you know, marketing too well. But, mm. but yeah, you do get into that, into that problem. That's really interesting. Um, in, in terms of um, how the business is operating internationally, is London still the, the kind of main hub, the headquarters? Are they kind of totally independent businesses now? How does it, how does it work? Uh, no, we've never had a headquarter model. Uh, London right. remains the biggest, biggest part of the business at 200 and something. Uh, but it's about, anyway, let's go on revenue terms. It's about 40%. Australia is about 40%. Right. And America is about 20%. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's never been a headquarters model. We have group staff kind of scattered, you know, the group managing partners in Australia. Our chairman and our deputy chairman are in America. Um, we've got our CFO is in London. You know, our, um, you know, so, so it's, 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 it's kind of spread around. We, we, we don't have a, we have a cost center model. So, we don't, you know, we're not looking at, you know, each place obviously got to make a profit, but but we're we're paid, and actually the staff, you know, the staff profit shares paid from the group. Right. So that's been the other thing, you know. There's a kind of, yeah, you know, you've got to be fighting against the I'm all right, Jack, sod the rest kind of thing that comes in, which is like, you know, uh, I don't know, LA is making a profit, but nowhere else is. So LA thinks it's fine, but it's like if the group's not making profit, then we're all doing badly. So oh. you, so yeah. when I. I present the um, the figures every every month with our CFO. It's always group. There's never, you know, we don't break down the studios. It's just Scrimshaw. Sure. Um, this is where the group is. This is where the group, you know, staff cost ratio. And we might drill down into it. This is why it's out. Mm. And this is why, the, you know, it's, there's a particular um, pressure or challenge in a particular studio or studios. And then we look at those studios and say, well, how can we help? Because it's we're, we're all you know, ultimately we're we're all in it together. We work we we win work as a network of partners. You know the the whole thing about the global opportunities thing and having a little executive that worked it out is to go is to do a best athlete thing, which is right. Okay, this project might be in Chengdu, but is it is the best person in New York to do it? I mean, we we recently won a, a first a first project in India uh, for Noida Airport, and um, we've got a great guy. Um, in um, Kashap, who's based in um, in New York, really good on the aviation, really good on aviation planning. He's Indian as well, which helps. And he um, he you know he he was you know it was a really weird times for him, but he was involved in in the process it was done from London. Uh, so um, you know, but Kashap was the right person to work on it, so we freed him up to 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 contribute. And I think that's again the real strength of the practice, and that's the strength of. You know, Zoom opening the world up is that we can we can just kind of we, we can more easily pick up the the pieces uh, that we need to put together a kind of a proposition, hopefully a winning proposition. Got it. How, how do you disqualify projects then? How do you know when it's not a, when it's not a right fix? It's um, it's really interesting. That you're saying you're in this lucky position or this you know position where the, the business is so well known that there's a lot of stuff coming at you. How do you know when it's not the right fit? Uh, yeah, well, don't get me wrong. It's still, it's still, you know, we still lose. You know, still, we lose more than we win, much more than we than we win, and it's still tough and it's still hard, and we 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 lose a lot all the time. I think the difference is that certainly on some projects, and I'm thinking of metro aviation, rail. You know, we're always on the list. Some partners always want us to be on there because of our reputation. So in terms of that stuff, we don't have to mar- market. But there are, you know, like. We don't do much commercial property in any other place except Sydney, which does loads of towers and resi and other bits and pieces, as well as higher ed and some other bits. So we, you know, we're looking to try and get that expertise out in the market in 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 other places in, in in other places. But in answer to your question, how do we um, how do we decide? Well, we've worked quite hard. I've worked quite hard recently um, uh, with Keith Brewis, who's our kind of um, uh, who's our international managing partner. So he looks after the kind of our endeavours mm. outside of the home territories. He, um, he and I, uh, with, with Jean-Luc Millis, who's our client relationship manager, we've, we've, we've worked out uh, a set of guidelines. So we've basically got uh, six, six things we look at um, and we give it a, we give it a sort of a rag status, so we sort of like a traffic light system. 
And what we've done is we've said, look, if you can get green lights and all these six things, then you can just get on with it. You know, don't bother. It doesn't have to go to an executive. But if it's got some red lights, then it has to go to the executive to talk about. So red light doesn't mean you don't do it. Red light just means you need to think about it because it might be a client we haven't used before. Payment terms might be a bit funny. You know, it, the, the, there, are, there are certain things, you know, it's like, you know, chances of winning. If it's one in three, then it's it's kind of green. If it's uh, one in six, it's kind of amber. If it's above six, then, you know, we, we, if it's open, then we genuinely probably wouldn't go for it. But if you're in China, it's always one of 10. So right. you've got to kind of accept certain places of, uh, do certain things. Um, so, the, yeah, there's a bunch of, you know, is it a sector we know? Is it a country we know? Um, we then have quite a detailed, um, you know, we've built up quite a good database of commercial risk things and, you know, liabilities and you know, performance bonds and all of those complicated things. Um, so, but it's just a regular checklist, which I think is, it serves two purposes. It, it, it streamlines the decision, so the decision can be made quickly, but also it provides a really good um, educational tool to, um, well, I think some of our partners as well, by the way, but but, oh, but some of the staff too. So that it's kind of, it kind of pro- teaches them from our perspective, what good looks like. Now, having said that, we will look at anything. If we think it's fun and it's good and, and you know, it's gonna, it's different and we think we've got a chance to win um, and architects lie to themselves about that all the time, then, <laughs> then, 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 we'll, do, then we'll do it. Um, if, we, if we've got a good in or we want to, you know, we want to try and prove ourselves or at least do some, you know, proactive research in a particular sector or a particular mm. country, we want to get to know it a little bit more, then we'll, we will, we will invest, even though I know that architects mix up losing money and investment <laughs> uh, as being the same thing, but they're not. <laughs> well, well, what, what makes a good successful bid for the projects that you do win? Why is it that you're winning? Or do you, do you know what the kind of criteria is that had you win it as opposed to another, another practice? And obviously, you know, you guys um, have got some extraordinary you know, back, cut, back catalog of projects, if you like, and really a dominant force in, in infrastructure. And often there is so much com- competition in those types of projects. What makes a successful bid? Um, well, for us, I think that if we can have engagement with the client, I think that makes a big difference for us um, because, you know, we've got to kind of understand the problem. You know, for us, we really, uh, well, you know, Ryan, you work for us, so you know we like to you we would like to really, really understand the problem. And I think unless we can ask and have that, have that, you know, we can't, you know, if if if, if we're designing something like a, you know, that's going to be like an ornament, you know, a series of ornaments on the on the mantelpiece, and someone's going to come along and pick pick one, then they won't pick the Grimshaw one. They'll they'll pick a big one or a Zaha one. You know, they'll they'll, they'll pick a different one. But I think if we have <laughs> ch- chance for engagement, and, and you do get it with the bigger Project, especially the bigger infrastructure projects, because there's a lot of money involved, especially when they're PPP bids or something like that, when, you know, really a deep understanding of the problem and of the sector and the technical aspects of it are quite, you know, and, and then you still want to have great architecture and a great, you know, customer experience and a, and a, and a you know, great building, then, then we're a company that does better with those things, but also we don't fold under the weight of the problems. Yeah, because you know, other architectural firms either fold under the weight and don't do such a good job, or they basically ignore some of them because yeah. they're too difficult, and then the client doesn't kind of get what they want. So, I think we do we do well at finding that kind of nexus, that overlapping point where you've got all of these conflicting needs, and there's there's that one point where they all meet, and there's a and that's where we like to try and try and get to. So, so I think that that's those are the best. Uh, the best projects but we I mean we'll but in terms of bidding you know we we we're learning all the time you know we're trying to make our writing better trying to answer the questions mm. trying to you know use things to to get our ideas across as as as, as good as we can and and uh, but it's a continually you know it's a it's an arms race uh, you know of, of, of stuff and you know you just I was looking with interest at the Shenzhen Opera which we didn't go for because it was a bit too open but there was some some amazing uh, projects a bizarre choice for the first I thought but but there's some amazing uh, uh, I'm uh, in, amazing in, in, other things in um you mentioned in how you guys have been collaborating recently with with smaller practices um for example haptic 
Um, how, yeah. how have those relationships evolved? That's really, I, mean, I think that's really innovative from, from a business like Grimshaw to be, to be doing that. And, you know, what, what kind of brought those collaborations about? Uh, well, it's usually, it's, it's the thing, it's kind of personal um, connections. I mean, the haptic one is, um, well, the yeah, haptic one of the owners, Thomas Stocker, his dad, Goodmund, <laughs> owns uh, Nordic. And Nordic are very well, incredibly well respected. Um, practice does a lot of aviation projects, and they were looking to work outside of Norway. They'd done kind of Garda Moen and uh, Goodman. He's a wonderful man, uh, very erudite, great architect, a really lovely person. So he kind of came to us to, to con- collaborate on a few things. Uh, so we collaborated on the Istanbul New Airport, so we won that, and we've co- we collaborated on Noida. So the, 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 the recent Indian one was with the Nordic and Arctic as well. Uh, and I think we've just got a good, you know, we just, you know, we've got shared values uh, and just used to working with an haptic again. They've collaborated with us on Houston. Uh, and I, I think, you know, personally, you know, if, if I go back, actually, Nick has had a really good, um, so, so uh, you know, relationship with, so um, Bryden Woods, who you'll, who you'll know, yeah. used to work at Grimshaw's, they, they left. Uh, we did the first bit of I guess, and then Nick gave the subsequent stages to them as to help them kind of set up the business and has always been very, very pro- proactively kind of helping them. So, uh, you know, Nick never sort of bore any ill at that sort of thing. He was, I think he was quite, uh, he was quite supportive of that. I mean, we're just submitting for the new gallery Victoria here, which is a you know cultural project. Um, I think we've probably got, I think we've got John Wardle's name all over it as being the local sort of star, just got gold medal, you know, his, his, his star is ascending. Uh, but we've, we've, you know, we, instead of going, you know, get try and you know, link up with another big architect, we've just gone with four emerging practices, mm. just because we think it'll be interesting. And I think that for us, it works. You know, those relationships. It's a bit like it's a bit like our relationship here. You know, Nick always said, you know, throw your ideas on the table and, and fight for the best one. And I think that's our approach to it. It's never a kind of big dog and chihuahua relationship between a big right. firm and a small firm. It's it's about you know, what can you bring to the table? Best idea wins. Yes, let's do that one. doesn't matter whether it's mine or yours. Let's just get on with it. Let's just win the project. And I think that allows you to collaborate. Um, and I think that, um, you, know, you know, methodology is quite, an, 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 you know, analytical. I mean, we, we, you know, we're quite kind of practical people, but not boring, but, you know, kind of, you know, we, we do like to make sure things can work and that they're, they're sensible. Uh, but I, and I think that helped you know p- people kind of see inside the machine when we're working together. But I, I mean, I personally enjoy it. I mean, you, you're a, you know, you're a leader of a practice. You're effectively a, a teacher in some respects, and you're trying to yeah. bring your staff on. I mean, you know, I've completed a lot of great projects, which I'm very proud of. But one of my, some of my proudest things are that you know um, Neil McClements, Andy Thomas. And Lee Crick, or well, these are all partners of mine, have all worked for me. They're all juniors working for me, and they're all now Declan McCafferty, uh, you know, Andrew Byrne, Andrew Perez. They're all partners at the firm now. And they all work for me back in London. And um, it gives me great, you know, pride mm. that, you know, they've, we've, 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 we've kind of, they're sitting shoulder to shoulder with me um, as an owner. Um, and they've worked really hard for it, but I've, I've enjoyed the fact that, that, uh, in some small way, I've been able to kind of give them the opportunities to shine. So that's um, that's I mean that's what that's what you do. So it's the same for a smaller firm. Yeah, you know, and you know, as long as you know, as long as you both come to a relationship with a sense of openness and, and a willingness, then 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 it's fine. You know, it's, you know, leave your ego at the door as far as it, as far as concerned when you when you when you're working with us because it's not you know we're not. We don't want to, we don't, you know, as you know, we don't go kind of floating around in a felt hat and cane and, <laughs> and all that stuff. We're not they're one of those sorts of, um, sorts of architects, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the kind of uh, what, what small practices can bring to larger practice, how does it change the, how does it change the working dynamic? What are the sorts of things that you guys really look for in a, in a small practice to make a successful collaboration? Um, it's a very good question. I, th- I think what they bring to it is probably an easier. I don't know what we look for because I think it's just, just to do with personality, to do with whether you think you can get right. and get on with them, um, and whether they work in a kind of similar and complementary way. 
which I know you can only tell by, but you, you may have collaborated or sat on a design panel, panel with them or you, you know, something like that. But I think the um, uh, what you can learn is that there's just an agility and a freeness. You know, we, we you know, as, as you said, 25 years at Grimshaw is a blessing and a curse. You know, it's kind of like you're, we've been doing this for 25 years and, and, and it's great to get a challenge of, of orthodoxy. You know, it's, it's um, if, if you've got to keep the practice fresh uh, and, you know, and, and just, you know, have that kind of insatiable desire for something new. And I think younger, you know, newer practices, you know, I'm not saying we don't have it, we do have it, but yeah. I think you feed off it. And if someone just comes in from left field, you know, they're, they're coming from a place that you wouldn't ordinarily go to because we don't normally go that way. You know, because that, that's one of the biggest problems with having a, you know, having a larger practice is that it, you become, and I've noticed this in some of the younger staff, not from the partners, but they become, you become self-reverential. It's, it's almost like meta. You become meta. Mm. You get people kind of doing, like I did Pulkovo Airport, you know, with a very distinctive kind of angular roof, uh, which was actually in collaboration with a, with a younger architect who came in and helped us out and did a fantastic job. Um, we... Uh, you know, it's it's people then go off and do it, and I'm I'm saying to them, why are you doing it? You know, because Pulkovo was it was announced to a specific set of problems. You're just using the image of Pulkovo to create something. You know, what, why 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 are we doing it? Yeah. And and I, and I think you know that is the question that Nick always asks. You know, that's what we always ask. Why is it like that? It can look as doesn't look as crazy as anything, but you've got to give me a reason. Why is it like that? Yeah. You know, ideally, there's an engineering reason, there's an economic reason, there's a social reason, there's a you know urban reason for something being the way it is um and and that's that's really the the, the biggest problem with a larger practice and i think younger ones i don't have the baggage that they, they, they just come with intelligence and ambition and as long as they've got a good work ethic and that, that, that you know they're willing to not sort of you know just go well because i like yellow or whatever you know as an answer to a question as long as they can get into it then, then i think yeah. we would, we would we'd love, love to work with them and i think you know architecture is a you know, can be a cauldron of jealousy and unhelpful people it can be, you know, people just bitter and twisted at other people's successes. It's a very sort of almost like a kind of Jacobean court in that regard. And I think that, um, you know, the more we can do to, uh, you know, you know, collaborate, share our experiences and because we're all in this, we're all, we are all, I know we're in competition, but we are all in it together. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I think the more we can, we can share. I mean, I've got some great, Great friends. I'm, I'm very friendly with Simon Alford and with John McCall from John, John McCulgan from Rogers and, and uh, Tracy Meller. So we do have conversations about kind of you know the business side and things like that. So it's you know those always really help when you find like-minded uh, people to have a have a kind of share your um, challenges with. Um, but like you know, it's, uh, they come from above and below. <laughs> you can you can speak to people who are at the head of practices, and you speak to people who are just you know got new smaller ones of have got as much, uh, you know, interesting things to say. So, um, you know, I'm just very open. Again, it's one of the things that I think allowed me to be a group managing partner. You just got to be open to, mm. open to anything. You know, just let the madness happen. That's what I <laughs> saw out. Just let it, let it go. Let's see where we get to. Brilliant. And um, I'm interested as well talk, talking to you a little bit about, you know, uh, Grimshaw's, you know, one of the dominant forces in infrastructure and aviation, and obviously. I think in the press, aviation gets a lot of bad press. I think it's a lot, it's it's very misunderstood. And my time yeah. at Grimshaw, I was always amazed actually at how complex the process was. And, and the role of the architect was actually one like a lawyer in many ways, where you're presenting a very fair and balanced view on all of these projects. And I remember the discussions and the transparency at Grimshaw uh, okay. about you know, certain types of projects that might be, you know, deemed controversial or, you know, mm -hmm. might have kind of thoughts on it. What, what are your thoughts on, you know, how do you, how do you retain and balance that conversation within the practice itself? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a good, well, hopefully we do have the transparency. We do, I mean, there's there a lot of conversations amongst partners about these things because we do have a concern about it. Uh, so, I mean, aviation, I think, if I speak about aviation specifically, it's become a bet noir. People really don't know what they're talking about when they talk about it. You know, aviation is only one and a half percent of, 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 of kind of carbon. 
uh, the industry is very motivated to go to hydrogen or to um, you know uh, biofuels. Uh, our role is we don't run planes. I'm not, that's not ignoring it. Yeah. It's just basically saying that, that we don't run planes, but we can help um, people decarbonize their estates. You know, something like Heathrow, ni- over 95% of the pollution, noise and, 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 and air is by cars. And, you know, and as we do mass transit systems, if we have you know, an effective mass transit system, then you can cut out a lot of those things and you can really, you can green airports. If you compare road travel, which is nearly sort of 11, 12% of, of, of global emissions, you know, there is just not a hoo-ha from ACAN and from all that, from all those, you know, well-meaning organizations yeah. about agri- agriculture. The use of concrete is 6%. You know, there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of kind of negativity towards it without because it's a, it's an easy thing. Don't fly. It's terrible. Don't fly. I think Greta Thun- Thunberg, you know, you know, not 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 using the carbon to go d- didn't help its cause. But there are other things that could be that could be targeted in, in yeah. my view. And the benefits of travel, you know, the the you know hundreds of millions of of, of pounds have been wiped off the the GDP of many African countries and 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 their you know. Um, uh, you know their inhabitants are suffering as, as, as a means of it. You know cultural exchange, all of those things have, 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 have changed with air travel. And I would say that if we do have to spend our carbon on something, because we do, mm. then why not why not air travel uh, and then support the industry to decarbonise? And I think that it will decarbonise. So so we've made a kind of strong statement um, about it. We we believe in it. I think that there's a lot of emotion. Uh, around it but you know I, I, I genuinely I'm not trying to say it's perfect because it isn't there's nothing that's perfect but if you were if you were going to you know if, if you were, if I was an activist and I was going down the things that were the biggest polluters and try and knock them off you'd be going through a lot of things before you got to aviation yeah yeah that's, that's, that's really interesting and, and again like you say it's kind of it's just wildly misunderstood in the in a lot of the press and it's an, it's an easy one to attack yeah, no, no. Listen, I get it. It's like an architectural concept. You can. It's like a one-liner. You can get it. You know, oh, they're up in the sky. They're polluting the sky. They're, they're really bad. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that, and there is that element to it. I'm not denying it. There is, there is pollution there. Yeah. But the, but, but you know, the planes are becoming more efficient. They are trying to design hydrogen planes. All of the things I've, I've already said. Uh, and what we can do is we can look at making, you know, net carbon zero ready terminal buildings. Integrated transport, we can we can use it. You know, uh, um, in terms of you know, we could be saying things like it will not use uh, and any. You know, it, no water will leave a site. We'll reuse all the water. We'll do you know all of these things. Uh, you know, can promote biodiversity because of the area that it is. Uh, you know, and it's got quite you know um, the use of waterways and stormwater things. So, so there's lot there's lots of stuff that it can do. It's a very very complicated issue, um, and I think that um, you know you've got to. You know, I, I think fundamentally, Grimshaw believes in technology. We yeah. believe in, in in the future. We don't believe in abstinence, right? We're not we're not we're not kind of Presbyterian in that way. We believe in technology. We think that 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 technology will 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 solve this, and we want to work with whoever to get to that point. Brilliant. What's what's in store for the rest of twenty twenty one for Grimshaw and for yourself? Um, lockdown. Well, well, for my uh, for myself, I'm hoping to get back to London, so I'd like to come back and see my family. So I'm planning to come back in June, which would be great, just for the pubs to open. I think <laughs> uh, no, uh, there's no no coincidence there. Um, so to do that, but yeah, we're working on West Metro, so we've got quite a few big deadlines for West Metro. So that's that's quite an exciting um, time. But I would like to. Um, I'd like to win another couple of projects here in Australia. In terms of Grimshaw, we're um, you know we're in a bit of a, you know COVID's been quite challenging, quite challenging for everybody. The business has been hit, so I'm hoping to get us. We are getting back on an even keel. Uh, you know we're going to make a profit this year again, uh, but it's much diminished. Uh, and I hope to just just be in a really good place uh, in terms of some of the strategic things that we're doing. We'll be able to see the business a bit better through the dashboard <coughs> thing that I spoke about. Hmm. And also, we'll be able to do well with our um, our global opportunities, and we'll sort of we'll win a few bigger projects globally. But I think that we are um, 
uh, and then you know, and just keep the quality of our output. Just keep it going. Keep, you know, keep keep doing things things differently. I don't want to become a, you know, we. Do, I don't believe that there is a style that we have that is applicable to every country in this in in, in the world like some architects do. I think yeah. we, uh, which is fine, and I'm not. You know, that's that that's their that, that's their business and that, that their kind of um, treatise on architecture. Uh, you know, I, I just like to do, you know, for us to do some really exciting buildings and keep keep moving forward. I'm looking forward to so Man Botanic Gardens, which we've, which is on site, uh, maybe open, yeah, maybe back end of the year, maybe it'll be early next. But I'm quite looking forward to that getting to a stage. I'm quite looking forward to going to see it, but obviously I can't. I haven't been able to go and see it for a while. But I've seen the photographs. We have a guy, a couple of guys on site, but I'd like to see that. But yeah, there's a there's a lot ahead. There's, a, I mean, we've. Um, you know, the business has come a long way in my 25 years. It's gone from 30 to over 500 people. Amazing. It's gone from one office to eight offices, and you know, um, you know, personally to you know, uh, without sounding conceited, you know, won the Lebeckin Prize, put on the cross. You know, we were shortlisted for London Bridge, the Sterling Prize. You know, it's it's gone pretty well, really. Quite quite happy. <laughs> It, 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 it turns- I feel incredibly lucky. I feel like Zelig there. I feel like I've just been at kind of accidentally in at the background of world events. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> in, in terms of you've saying there how much the, uh, the business has grown and expanded, and also one of my most memorable experiences at Grimshaw was always the people, and was always this kind of very unique culture. And um, and obviously, you know, COVID has kind of changed the way that people have you know are working and kind of people working remotely how has Grimshaw been able to maintain that company culture um as it's expanded and also kind of how's it tried how's it tried to navigate it during during covid um well it's been a challenge uh i think all the staff have done an amazing job just to be able to kind of cope with the change overnight and we don't think we've lost a day you know we we just where we went so our it guys i've got to say shout out to them because you know, in terms of access to server Zoom and all that has been absolutely brilliant and working with things like Miro and, you know, kind of these collaboration tools that we've been using have been really good. Uh, learning that Teams is absolutely crap and <laughs> Zoom is so much better uh, has, been, has been one of those things. But, but, but we've, you know, we've kept the things that we, we do. You, you'll know the Friday at Fives, we've kept the Friday at Fives. Yeah. Um, we, we, we're really good that we've got, you know, we've got... Um, uh, Karen McKenzie is one of our uh, is one of our EAs in London. She does an audience with. She does a kind of like interview with partners and principals to kind of get their kind of you know which is which is recorded and sent around. We have our kind of webinars that I do about our performance. Um, you know, there's the usual kind of quizzes and things like that. It's been slightly different here in Sydney, obviously, because we're in the office and we we've been in the office um, all, all together. So the Friday at fives and the socials and things like that would be exactly as. Uh, people people would would recognise, but it's been might have been very difficult in the other offices. So I think we've done a pretty good job. We've put a lot of money a lot of money and time into. So my 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 old EA back in London, uh, um, Emily Watts, is, is it looks after. She's on the she's on the well being kind of RBA forum, and she's done a lot for us. With you know, we had Lionheart, who's a poet. We had a poet in residence. We've had um, we were just about to. Do a film on mind, mindfulness. She, we, we've got, we, we, you know, we're gonna, we're just gonna get into. We, we think we're going to subscribe to this Unmind um, app and make this available. And there's a lot of mindfulness, you know, kind of weeks and, and th- th- things like that. So I think we've done quite a lot of things. And, and it's kind of when you get to be a bigger firm, you can kind of afford to do some of these things. So, so yeah. I think we've been quite open to to that. We've got, you know, we do, we do, we do. Um, uh, uh, meditation, which I go to, which is on a fr- Thursday or Friday, th- Fridays usually, um, which our, our BD, our client relationship manager Jean Luc does here, and uh, he okay. does it also in London. Uh, so we do, yeah. I mean, we, I think we, we just, as you all know, as a company, we just, if anyone comes up with any idea, we're like, yeah, yeah, let's let, 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 let's let's have a go. I know they've had things like Sri Lankan cookery kind of evenings where they've sent out that you need to get all of this stuff, and then. Mo Bala, who's one of our associate principals in Sri Lankan and has been in New York, but now in London, he's led a kind of cookery course for everybody, which is really great fun. And uh, so I think, you know, again, it's the staff have been doing some great things. And, and I think that I'm just really glad we've got a business whereby they feel that they are 
supported in doing these things and they can they can effectively they can be them they can be themselves uh so i think that i i, I hope it's been that but that's not to take away from the fact that it's been incredibly hard in, in yeah. you know in, in new york and, and london and uh, and melbourne much more so than it has been here got it got it great well, i think that's the, a, a great place for us to conclude the conversation mark and just want to say a massive thank you for your generosity with your your time this morning and your expertise and and hearing uh, all about the inside outs of Grimshaw and, and your career has been absolutely fascinating. It's, it's, my, it's my pleasure, Ryan. It's great to connect with you again. It's fantastic. And yeah, I mean, I hope there's something in there. I mean, obviously, I mean, we're a different size of practice and, you know, maybe hopefully people don't think I'm being blasé by talking about certain things, but, you know, you can only talk about your own experience, can't you? And uh, so anyway, I hope some, some people, people get no, some, something out of it. And if, if there's any questions, feel free to pass them on to me and I'll see what I can do. But it's a pleasure to speak to you and uh, and it's great. The podcast is going so well, so congratulations. Thank you very much. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.